Good evening and welcome to Ayin La Soufre, a Georgetown virtual community meeting. This meeting is part of a series of community meetings being organized by NEMO to update the various communities on the La Soufre volcano. You may have heard by now that the La Soufre volcano has been having effusive eruptions over the last several weeks. We have with us this evening the Prime Minister of St. Vincent and the Grenadines, Dr. the Honorable Ralph E. Gonzalez, who will be presenting. He's also the Minister with Responsibility for Disaster Management here in St. Vincent and the Grenadines, and also the Parliamentary Representative for this area, Georgetown, Langley Park, etc. We also have the Director of the UWI Seismic Research Center, Dr. Yurisilla Joseph. We also have with us the Chairman of the UWI COVID-19 Task Force, Professor Clive Landis, geologist from the UWI Research Center, Professor Richard Robertson, and of course we have the Director of NEMO, St. Vincent and the Grenadines, Miss Michelle Ford. The La Supra volcano, by way of background, is the only live, potentially active volcano in St. Vincent. The volcano stands at 3,864 feet above sea level. There have been five explosive eruptions at the La Supra during the historical period 1718, 1812, 1814, 1902, and 1903, and the last one in 1979. Several effusive eruptions have also occurred at the volcano. In 1979, an effusive phase followed the initial explosive phase of the eruption. In 1971-72, an effusive eruption created a lava dome that existed until the 1979 eruption. The most recent dome building, effusive eruption, began on December 27, 2020. Visual observations on December 29, 2020 confirm that high temperatures detected by satellites used to track fires were in fact caused by magma reaching the surface. With that background, we now would like to invite Prime Minister of St. Vincent and the Grenadines, Dr. the Honorable Ralph Gonzalez, to make his presentation. Prime Minister. Thank you very much, Theresa, and good evening to all our friends from overseas who are here with us. And um, I, I see that Dr. Professor Robertson is on also. Well, he's not a friend from overseas, he's a Vincentian born. Our friends from the Seismic Research Center, I want to say how happy I am that members of the community of Georgetown and the back area, which is in the red zone that they are on this consultation, this community meeting this evening. I'm, I'm not going to speak um, for any particular length of time. In fact, I'm hoping that I can just spend five minutes and let the professionals speak to the matter. Just to say to the people of Georgetown and Langley Park, that the government of St. Vincent has been working assiduously with the Seismic Research Center, with the regional security system, with the Caribbean Disaster Emergency Management Agency, and of course, the, the Seismic Research Center has been front and center in, in, in all of our work. And we thank them very much for being on the ground to help us monitor in this oozing eruption thus far. We, we are in a much better place in having information because of the number of stations which we have, observation points and facilities we have put in place together with the SRC, you know, they have been instrumental. And we have in our budget, which is presented, the estimates are presented tomorrow to Parliament, 
um, significant monies to protect these sites um, and, and to, to, to put the facilities at the Belmont observa Observatory in much better shape. We are also going to strengthen the staffing of NEMO, including with a geophysicist, a geoscientist, and also an engineer to be able to build the, to maintain the equipment. As you noticed, um, Dr. Pat Joseph, you know you had made those recommendations to me in a memo, and um, we have implemented them quite promptly. Uh, so it's a question of recruiting those persons. The resources are in the, the 2021 budget. The, we have we have had a, a volcano emergency plan, but just recently updated. I have a copy here in my hand called the St. Vincent Eventing Volcano Emergency and Standard Operating Procedures. Uh, the a work of this kind is critical, and, and I'm sure that Michelle would speak to it when she does her professional presentation. And, and we always have to make adjustments uh, in our hoping for the best and planning for the worst. I we uh, we have a list of all the the centers, the, the the centers where we can go to if the volcano was to erupt in an explosive fashion. And we are also not only looking at the schools in the areas from South Central Windward to um, Central Leeward, but very much so also in the, the Grenadines. And we, we, we have gotten offers uh, amounting to close to 3,000 rooms. In, in facilities outside of St. Vincent and Grenadines. And of course, we have made, we have put, we have a number of guest houses lined up here in St. Vincent and the Grenadines, just in case. We hope we don't have to get there. Um, and, and Michelle will talk a little bit about the, 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 the plan, the volcano emergency plan. I want to urge everyone to be calm in this matter, to be very patient. And I want you to listen to the official sources for government information. In these days when you have so much fake news coming on Facebook and, and, and other social media platforms, you a, a lot of um, just pure wrong information can be put out and you just listen to the official voices. Be assured that the government is putting all the requisite resources to this effort and we have a detailed plan and that plan has been discussed and we'll continue to discuss it with the persons who potentially would be affected in the red zone and in the orange zone. And I want to give you that assurance. You, you know that um, over the last 20 years, when I give you an assurance, you can essentially, as we say in the countryside, put your pot on the fire and expect that it will, it will happen. There are always going to be challenges. Um, not everything will go perfectly. If the worst happens, we are even, just in case we have to move persons by boat, we are making those sorts of prearrangements and to make sure that the, the jetty, for instance, on Chateaubelle is in order. And if the persons have to go into Barry, that one is in order. 
we just have a report on the one in Leu. Um, and of course, we'll move people out of Ovia by the war if necessary. Um, but we have enough vehicles on the road and that will have to be managed properly. So there are a lot of logistics. I give just an indication of the many moving parts which we have to address. But I don't want to get ahead of myself because we are hoping for the best and planning for the worst. And we hope the worst never happens. And we just keep ourselves properly informed. Every single household should have their own family emergency plan. There's a lot of information on the radio about what you must pack in your bag, keep it handy, so at the shortest moments you can move, and so on and so forth. All those practical things are, are, are there all time. Listen. Don't just listen to the music on the various radio station and gossip talk. Listen to serious business concerning your own welfare, particularly on a matter like this. And I'm looking forward to your questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Prime Minister. At this point, we'd like to introduce Professor Richard Robertson of Incension, who has been heading the UWI seismic research team that's here in St. Vincent on the ground, and he will give his presentation at this time. Professor Robertson. Thank you much, Tar Thank you very much, um, Teresa. I'd just like to share my screen. All right, yes. And thank you very much, um, Prime Minister. Good afternoon, all. Um, I think we're here to try to educate the Georgetown community about what can happen. So I'm going to take you through a few slides to speak about where we, where we were, and where we are, and where we're hoping to get to. Um, just by way of, of introduction, um, we are part of the Seismic Research Center. We monitor earthquakes and volcanoes throughout the Eastern Caribbean, and we are set up to do precisely what we are doing now, which is to respond to emergencies like the eruption in St. Vincent and provide government with the advice that it need. We are not singular in terms of having volcanoes in St. Vincent. We have lots of volcanoes in the region. Um, we just happen to have one that likes to go off every now and then more often than perhaps we would like, but it does. And therefore we have to learn to live with it. Lasso Freya is a really um, interesting stratovolcano. It's, it's quite high, it's quite wide, and it has a lovely summit crater. I'd like, I'd like to take you to some aspects of it. We've had historic eruptions, um, 1718, 1812, 1902, 1979. And in between, we've had still things going on. Sometimes it has a dome, sometimes it doesn't. Um, and you've had various forms. This is how it looked in prior to 1902. Um, the 1900s, it had a, a lake. Just before 1902, it, 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 it continued to have a lake. Um, and then after 1902, you had the damage from the eruption that you had there. There's some pictures that show you some of the damage that occurred because it had a, an explosive eruption. But by the 1930s to the 70s, um, this is how it looks. It had a beautiful crater lake in it. And then in 1971, a dome was created, an island was created, it boiled the lake. Um, and then that, that actually went on for about a year. And, and that's how the lake looked from 71, the crater looked from 71 to 79. You had a lake in it um, and you know people continue to use it but then in, in 79 um it it grew a dome and you know people looking at the current dome and seeing how it looks in a particular way you you could see it it, it has the same kind of generally same kind of morphology so dark colored rock with lots of steaming going on so that's how it looked in 79 before it got to the stage that it was eventually um later on the fact is we've had periods in st vincent in Soufre when you have had what we call effusive eruptions, creating domes. Um, there's a suggestion there was one in the 1780s and 1880, 1971, 72. And then you've had periods when you've had explosive eruptions, 1718, 1812, 1902, 1979. So you've had either eruptions that created domes or eruptions that was explosive. Um, my slide seemed to, sorry, it seemed to be kicking forward by itself for some reason. But anyhow, this is how the configuration of the crater looked 
um, just prior to the current activity. Um, you had a 1979 dome, you had a crater lake. This is a view from the eastern side if you went out on the Georgetown side. And the area we're going to look at and focus in on is the west southwestern side where you have a new dome being created. Um, but if you went up on the, on the eastern side, this is what you would have seen prior to this current time. Now, we've always had seismicity or earthquakes associated with a volcano. We've always had periods when you've had more earthquakes than normal. At Sufre, you generally tend to have, you know, sometimes one or two periods when you have one or two per month, sometimes one or two per day. But there have been periods in the past, and this is just a graph that shows you 2019 to present, um, when it, it has had a lot, a lot more. So you've had periods when you have had tens rather than one or two events per day. Uh, and, and that's kind of normal. You go up and you come down. Um, just prior to the current activity at the end of this of last year, we had a period in November where, the, where we had one of those elevated periods of seismicity. But in each, in each case, it doesn't necessarily foretell that something is about to happen. So that when, we real, when, when the, the, the dome was first realized in, in, on the 27th, was actually because of satellite imagery, as, as um, the moderator said. And the satellite imagery was further confirmed on the 30th, on the 29th, but sorry, on the 30th, but even before that, subsequent investigation indicated that there's actually a picture on the 27th, some tourists went up and they saw the, the beginning of the dome growth, um, which has continued since then. So essentially, from the 27th onwards, we've had a massive um, piece of mold of rock mound of rock being created in the, in, the, in the volcano. Basically, magma is coming from beneath the surface, slowly coming onto the surface, it's becoming solid, and it's, it's forming a rounded mass of, of rock. And, and initially, it, it's formed as a classic rounded, um, sort of equal shape, um, classic rounded shape. But then, as it became pressed against the sides, it has begun to move um, sideways, essentially, along the crater. And this is a profile that was done from photogrammetry um, work that was done by Dr. Adam Stinton, who's, who's on, the, on the call here, a colleague from Montreal Volcano Observatory, which shows you how the dome has developed from its initial sort of shape on the 3rd of January. Um, and as you see, as it began to abut against the 1979 dome, and as it began to press against the crater wall, it began to, to go sideways more so than it got higher. So currently, generally, its growth is more lateral sideways, in other words, rather than high. And at present, this is a picture recently taken, um, this is 26, two days ago, um, of how the dome looked. Uh, its total volume, based on a survey that we did using a, a drone, um, suggests that it is about 4.45 cubic million cubic meters in total size, in terms of its mass. Uh, its dimensions, its, its longest side is 428 meters, and the sides that are button against the crater wall and the 1979 dome is 200, about 217 meters, and then it's about 80, 80 or so meters high. It's growing at, at from, from the last estimate that was done on the 18th of January, it's growing at a rate of, of about 2.7 cubic meters per second. But if you look at the long term sort of growth from when it started, the growth rate is actually smaller than that, probably about 1.7, a little bit around that at, at rate per second. Um, so its long-term growth has, has not, it's not really changed very much, but essentially it started at a certain rate, went up a little bit, came down, went up a little bit, and it's, 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 it's not unusual for it to do that in terms of how domes operate. So that's the, that's the state, that's the situation. We have put in a lot more monitoring station because again, that's how we respond when volcanoes erupt. We, we, we send a team on the ground and they, they essentially beef up the network. They, they put in more stations. Now in this case, in the case of St. Vincent, our network had suffered significantly from the fact that we couldn't travel because of COVID. And therefore by the time the end of last year, we were more or less down to two stations. One was at Belmont. Um, there was one at the summit that was working, but in, not very useful. And then there was one in Camden Park. Since we've been here for about four weeks, we have rapidly moved to augment the network. So we now have two stations on the, sum, on, on the volcano, particularly one on the summit, close to the summit, and one about 130 way up. The other one on the summit is about 200 meters, 300 meters away from the, the rim itself. And then you have a number of stations on, on the lower flanks of the volcano, in, o, in Fancy, in Ovia, um, in Georgetown, and um, we have plans to put one in Orange Hill. We, we, as, as, the, as, the, as the weeks go on, we'd actually add some additional seismic stations. 
But in addition to the seismic stations, we have also put in stations that monitor not just for ground shaking, which is what the seismic stations do, but is monitoring for any change in shape of the volcano. And these are GPS stations. We have put them in on that, that would look at the, the potential swelling of the volcano because of influx of magma. We put them in at Fancy, um, on this, near to the summit, at, at, and there was one before at Belmont. We put one in on Georgetown. So essentially, we moved to make the monitoring network more in a state where we could detect things. We're working with collaborators overseas, colleagues overseas, to use um, remote sensing techniques like satellite imagery. This is an example of two images, one on the 2nd of January and the 13th of January that shows you how you could detect the change in the size of the mountain, and, and that's one way in which you could track it. We have moved towards, we have collected rocks from the volcano, a sample of it, and we will, will use it to try to analyze various things. Where's the material coming from? How is it, inter is it interacting with other material that was there? Was it depth? What was the rate at which is, is coming up? Those kinds of things will, will, will be determined from the analysis of these rocks. We have, we have taken pictures of it with a thermal camera that allows us to get an idea of the temperature. There's an example here for a picture taken by Dr. Stinton when we were sampling the dome. And it shows you a, a, a picture, regular picture on the left, um, one with a thermal camera on the right, showing you the dome is up to 590 degrees Celsius at the surface. It's even hotter beneath the surface. It's quite hot rock, and, and that has implications in terms of how it operates. The main effects currently of the eruption is really confined to the crater itself and the surrounding areas. And this, this picture here shows you classically one of the most significant things, that is vegetation damage um, in the southwestern direction on the upper flank of the volcano that is largely due to acidic um, gases. Basically, there's a lot of gases coming out of the volcano, mainly water vapor, mainly simply just the water in the crater um, being converted to steam because of the hot rock. But also you have carbon dioxide. And in addition, you have a lesser amounts of sulfur, various sulfur products, things like um, hydrogen sulfide, hydrogen chloride, hydrogen fluoride. And these, these gases, when they mix with moisture, they become very weak acids. And when they get waved by the, by the breeze up there that comes off the dome, they, they go down slope. And this is a picture that shows you when we first came on the left, how the, veg, how the, how the landscape looked. And on the right, you can see that brown staining, which is because of the acidic burn from the vegetation. Now, this is happening outside the crater, as well as you have inf effects inside the crater. Vegetation is damaged inside the crater. In this case, this is an example of damage due to heat. The thermal effect, the fact that the hot rock, when it falls off, it can ignite the vegetation and it can cause burning. And this is some burning that happened about two weeks ago when, when people were very, very concerned because of the fact that it appeared like if there was fire on the, on the mountain, it happened in the night and they saw the, the, the fire from the surrounding areas and, and understandably got quite concerned. But, but this kind of thing has happened and can happen and, and it would not be unusual. We, we manage the crisis by defining various hazard areas. So we have done hazard maps. This is a hazard map that essentially shows you the extent of the areas that could be impacted from explosive eruptions to a large extent. It shows you the red areas, which are the areas that are most dangerous and are going to be impacted by all the nasty things that explosive eruptions do. The orange area is less so, and then you move to yellow and green areas. You move into areas that are mainly affected by ash. Um, these are the areas, the red and the orange are the areas that you will have to move people south to minimize the impact and get them away from the negative impact of, of the explosive eruption if you have one. We're currently working on, on assessing the potential impact of just simply dome building and, and collapses from domes. That would have something that's slightly different than this, but it probably would, would, would assist in terms of Nemo taking the actions they need to. I'll, I'll end with this, looking at what's the prognosis, what do we think, you know, currently given what we know is likely to happen. One is that the dome can continue growing. Clearly, it's grown. Um, Soufre domes in the past have grown from periods of up to from three months to up to a year. The 1979 dome went on for about three or four months. The 1971 dome went on for about a year. So clearly, they can go on for more than a few weeks to months. Um, and that's one clearly one, one effect. And that itself would have some effects depending on how, the, how big the dome becomes and the, depending on whether or not it's able to get outside the crater in terms of the, the things that it do. The second thing that can happen clearly is that the eruption can stop um, and there's, there's nothing happening. Um, you know, it goes back to sleep. 
And then the, the probably the most thing, the thing that's most concerning is whether or not it goes into an explosive phase. It has an explosive eruption, in which case you will have periods in which you'll have explosions from the volcano, and therefore you'll have a production of a lot of ash. You'll have production of, of these flows that go down the mountainside that will damage areas further afield, and you have ballistics and fragments of rock falling out, and you probably have things like mud flows, lahars. So all the nasty things will affect the, the volcano itself. This is probably the thing that one would be most concerned about at this present time. I think that's it. So um, in summary, we need to continue to monitor the volcano. We need to continue to work towards um, preparing for the worst, as the Prime Minister said, but hoping for the best. I, I, I'll always your questions and try to answer as best I can. Thank you. Thank you so very much, Professor Richard Robertson, for that presentation. Our featured film is entitled Beyond the Ashes. It's about stories and lessons learned from the 1979 Lassufre eruption. It was produced by the Volcano Ready Communities Project through grant support from the Community Disaster Risk Reduction Fund. John, some nights ago, the father was talking to me, King Olo, telling me that Sophie will come again. So that's the reason why you come here now to explain. You get them on your knees and pray. Sophie coming again, Vincent shan be aware. Especially the people in Chateau Bile. Well, for Chateau Bile, when we run to Chomoka. And if I hear how they laughing on oh, kia 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 Some people say how we making joke How we see facts and take it for so free smoke In 1979, I think it was around um, April 13th to Friday The sky was looking real strange, clouds going up and then this mushroom started cloud, you know in, And we know something was going on and the moon was really shining I was baking cross buns so while we were putting the cross buns in the oven, we heard this big explosion. Look inside, we hear like a little, some little, like some little grub of stone coming down on the galvanized. But it was not rain, you know, but I didn't know what was happening. So I thought my husband, I say, here on the galvanized up there. And here when he peopled. He said, Angie, look out. When I look out, if you see the mountain, Outside was dark, like midnight. Martin woke me up about 7 o'clock in the morning and he said, Mary, I've got some bad news for you. The volcano is erupting. I said, yeah, right. This guy came up from Chateaubile and he started to sound the trumpet. Where's all people? I wake up, suffer a blow, suffer a blow. The call of Chateaubile is on the road. Wake up. The news spread like wildfire in a few minutes time. And then everybody, you know, up and down, getting to get ready. But I could not have get one thing to walk with just what I have on my skin. So we ran in and we got ourselves ready pick up our bags with little clothing. We go down to Chateauville and then after we go down there, we see the government sending things for people. But I did not go on the road, I go on the sea in a boat. And by the time we got up to the bus, there were lots of people, children, women, we manage to board the bus. Didn't know where we were heading for. Children were crying, you know, people were panicking and so on, because it was our first experience. But we tried to remain calm. <laughs> We 
we help somewhat in the evacuation. I go out in the country or to Georgetown and get transportation to get people in. We, you know, felt very, very responsible for the. Uh out there into the into the schools and so on. We, we were lucky and we having the estate were able to provide bananas and we have a village shop. We opened that up to, to everybody and to, they were okay for the first 48 hours. And then, you know, we had to then start leaning on the government to provide for the for everybody. The government used to supply food stuff. No one then. But from that, we will, we don't have to furnish our own thing, like buying fish and all those things. We didn't have to do that. There's some camps though where um, all you cook and give you food. It was really hard to really feed everybody at the time. As a matter of fact, too, that there are some persons who will leave in the, the, the camps and go out, and when they come back, it's not lunch time. It's not food time then, and then they would have. Um, finish all the things and then right. you start making noise and like that. But there's some people who are very lucky to that they, they got houses to stay in with their family so they didn't go to any camps or anything like that. I, I never went to a shelter. Really? After we left town, mm -hmm. we went out to Kialiakwa and we were staying with a friend in their house. They stayed in those schools for three months. The government put it over the air. Said the volcano is finished and then the evacuated people have to get home. After the, the eruptions and people return, um, they had a lot of cleaning to do because the ash all over. Ash was all about. Even in the house, I, I don't know how the ashes managed to get in the house. Yeah, my name has to go on the galvanize and get water up there to what? And you were in plenty of the galvanize. I mean, the roof was this thick and ash. I took a hose and I started cleaning, hosing down the place, not realizing that the water was also full of ash. I take days. I took jug water and flow the flow and get broom and sweep out just to get the ash. You know, so you had a lot of cleaning up to do. You had a lot of washing some of the animals because the animals had to be let loose. Let them loose and they never look better. So we lost some. You kind of have to restart. Trouble was, was to know what the real losses were. So we thought, you know, that we lost maybe a little bit, but in point of fact, it was a hell of a lot. When the damage hit us, uh, it was almost difficult to recover from it, you know. In fact, it was the end of the estate. It was, it the, was end the end of, of Orange estate. Hill in 84. They had to sell it, and it for almost nothing. The heat of the, the ashes scratch up a lot of the things, them. some of the bananas, them shrinking, the coconuts, them, and so on. It was a very diversified estate. Yeah. It had cocoa and coffee and, and all those little crops died immediately, and the coconuts just took longer to die, yeah. but they died. Well, you had to make a fresh start. Okay, you have to replant, like your vegetables and so on. One of the things that I usually do is to try to tell people you do not know when it would erupt again. So always keep your important 
items if in case it erupts you would have that time to go and pack up and so i learned that lesson you have to be always ready because we don't know when okay so we always have to have something put away that when anything you just put it get it and you, you lead out yeah. One moment, Madam Moderator, we're not hearing you. One moment, please. So we were saying that funding for Beyond the Ashes was provided by the Community Disaster Risk Reduction Fund administered by the Caribbean Development Bank and with support from partners NEMO, SVG Red Cross Society, and the Community Development Division. We'd like at this time to thank the Honorable Prime Minister and Professor Robertson for their presentation. We'd also like to remind visitors that they can pose their questions on YouTube Live or on the chat on uwitv.org. We have also been receiving um, some questions and I'm going to be posing these to Dr. Robertson. The first is, did people get signs of an eruption in 1979? I have heard most stories of people just waking up to an eruption. Seems like it took the nation by surprise. Um, yes, to a large extent. Um, the, the eruption and super eruption since the at least the explosive ones, sometimes they develop very rapidly. And in 79, there was some indication perhaps months before that they had, like we did just now, some um, periods of elevated seismicity. But in terms of knowing definitively that it was going to erupt, really, you probably had a few hours at most. And in the case, in those days, um, the monitoring wasn't quite the same. I guess it wasn't as, as um, diverse and real time as it is now. And what happened then was that because fortuitously, um, people were at seismic at the time when it happened in the, in the late afternoon on Thursday evening, I think they realized from the signals definitively that something was about to happen only late into the night. And by the time they had gotten on to the authorities, um, by, the, by the early morning sort of, people's, people sort of the messaging would not have necessarily gotten to the people that it looked like something was about to happen. It just happened too fast. And I think the mechanism wasn't there to perhaps, you know, get the message out as quickly. Um, but it does develop quickly. It takes a few hours sometimes to super to get going from, from nothing happening. Which is why I must say that, you know, what we have in now, in a sense, is quite a bit of precursory signal that it can do something. It's, it's telling us that it's having an effusive eruption and that, you know, 
we are we're now at the stage where we could tell people to do certain things so we should make use of in a sense all of this activity that's happening to put our house in order so the individuals need to to do that and not wait you know until something actually happens to do something i think it's it's given us quite a bit of of activity now which is effusive yes but i would take it as a warning that it could get explosive essentially Thank you very much. Um, the other question from YouTube, if an explosive eruption occurs, how fast will the people nearby the volcano be alerted? That's a good question. Um, I can't give you a definitive answer. It's quite uncertain in terms of whether we would, how much warning we would give or whether we would be able to, in fact. And that's why I keep saying that people really need to be on guard for moving very fast. We are working obviously to put in sufficient uh, monitoring elements that we will have some indication, but there is a chance that it simply would move from what is doing now, which is which is quietly extruding magma, to something that is much more active and faster and probably explosive um, within, within a matter of, of hours rather than days, as we would like. Um, I believe the, the National Emergency Organization would like to have, and I know given their plans, would like to have a couple of hours, probably a day or two. Um, there is no guarantee that that would happen. So I think we need to we need to hope that that would happen, but we need to prepare for the fact that you know you you you're you're essentially getting your warning now um, that something can happen, and that when it happens, there will be very little time. Um, it might be hours, it might be minutes, it might be almost instantaneous. And what you simply have to do when you get that. When you feel it, when you feel when you get the message that something is happening, you simply have to move south um, using the mechanism that that has been developed to do that. Okay, thank you again. And at this time, we'd like to invite um, Prayers happen, I think, one dome, and then once it's finished a dome building eruption, it then has an explosive eruption. Clearly, Susfe has the ability, and it seems in looking back at the records, I might have done it before, to have more than one dome in place in the volcano. From the record, it doesn't seem to make a difference whether it have one or two domes in terms of what it does explosively. Um, so just from the bare minimum that we have, that doesn't seem to make a difference in terms of whether or not one, it, one, one has one dome or two domes. But I would say that if you have a dome, I, I would expect that it's, it's more likely the more domes you have, given that super can be explosive, that the next thing that you do is, is have some sort of explosive activity. Um, you know, But really, the honest answer is that we don't know whether it makes that much difference. Um, Thank you very much. Um, I think that uh, there are two persons who are waiting to speak, so we give them that opportunity at this time. Mm -hmm. Natalie? Natalie, we are waiting for you. Maybe you may need to unmute your mic.
Okay, so Natalie is not ready for us, it seems. Um, there's a question here as well that we can ask. Is there a chance of a collapse of one side of the volcano? Um, mm, yes, again, <laughs> you, you guys are having some excellent questions. Um, the, yes, there is. I mean, there's always a potential for a collapse of any, any particular part of the volcano. Volcanic edifices are, are known, particularly in the Caribbean, for having collapses. They've had them in the past, and Sufra certainly in its past history has had a collapse. Um, this is one of the reasons why uh, I believe people would have seen two days ago, we put in something that we call an EDM reflector on one part on the southern part of the crater wall, mainly because we want to be very early in looking at potential failure along one flank. We don't think it's likely now, but the problem is that as the dome gets bigger, the mass of the dome is possible that it can cause so much stress on one particular part of the of the of the crater wall, the flank, that it could essentially cause it to fail. And we want to see if that's possible. So we have put an instrument, essentially a, a fancy mirror, in a sense, at the top of the mountain. And what we're going to do, we're going to work with the land surveys department to get one of the surveyors to come out and shoot a, a beam of light to it. And with the return period, uh, we look at the distance of the light. We can use it, the, the timing of the light and the distance it travels to get essentially a, a measure of the length from the instrument, from the reflector to where we're measuring from to see how long it is. And if we do that from various points, we would perhaps be able to, we'll be able to tell if that point on the crater rim is moving. And we'd expect that prior to failure, we have done some indication that it's under stress by that point moving. So we're going to measure for that. It's not something that we're particularly concerned about now, but it is something that may become more of a problem as the dome gets bigger, and we're already looking at its possible um, happening and therefore trying to find ways of monitoring for it. Okay, and there's another question I think for you. Someone wants to know how far can the poisonous gas travel and how right. can we protect ourselves from it? Yes, um, there was a question in the chat I, I actually responded to. A lot of the gases that come out, as I said, the main thing is really simply water. Um, so it's not, it's just vapor, water vapor, steam, essentially, like a boiling kettle. Um, then another set of gas that we've discovered from the measurements we had are carbon dioxide. And carbon dioxide tends to be very dense. It, it collects in hollows. It, it's probably going to be most, most rich in the crater itself where it can collect. The other thing in lower monks are sulfur-rich gases, you know, hydrogen sulfide, um, some self sulfur dioxide, hydrogen fluoride and fluoride, all of those, those gases and only gases that come up, they mix with the atmosphere and they get very dilute. Um, so that by the time they get further down slope, they're too dilute to cause any serious harm in terms of being really truly toxic. But some of the sulfur gases, some of the gases, if you have particular respiratory problems, if the levels get to above a certain, you know, perhaps the World Health Standard levels, they can cause problems. So, what we have suggested, and I believe um, NEMO and the authorities locally are moving in that direction, to monitor the quality of the air in the areas, in the villages, in the communities that surround the volcano. It, that's a precursory measure to ensure that if there's a chance of the gases, and we don't think there is because it's getting dilute, if there's a chance that it gets into the areas and it gets above a certain quality, a standard set by the World Health Organization, we can alert them and they could take action. That said, one of the perhaps the good thing about the gases that probably could cause problems to people, and the sulfur-rich gases, is that they're very smelly, essentially. So often when you smell them, our natural instinct is to move away. So if you smell, they, 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 in fact, the ones that you probably smell often is sulfur-rich, and you will tend to move out of the way. And if you if you have respiratory problems and it's causing you problems, you will simply move. So you, you should have that reaction long before it gets to the stage where it causes serious harm. Um, so, you know, it's being monitored. It's not a big problem we think currently is something to be watched. But if you have particular problems and you're particularly susceptible, you really need to perhaps think about, you know, moving a little bit further away if it becomes a problem. Thank you very much, Professor Robertson. At this point, we'd like to invite the director of the National Emergency Management Organization, Ms. Michelle Fox, to do her presentation and also let you know that there will be more opportunities to ask your questions after she has completed her presentation. Ms. Fox, over to you. Thank you very much, Ms. Daniel.
and um, good evening to everyone. Greetings to the Honourable Prime Minister and Dr. Robertson and team from Seismic Research Centre. I'm going to just um, spend a few minutes looking at our evacuation planning and zero in on Georgetown. We have seen this map um, quite a bit um, over the last few weeks, and this is our volcano um, volcanic hazard map for the Lassa Freire volcano, noting that we our emphasis is in the red zone and the orange zone. Now, many persons are asking if Georgetown is in the red zone, as we're zeroing on Georgetown this evening. Yes, Georgetown is in the in the in the um, red zone, and we can see the red zone extend all the way down here, going towards. Um, I believe it's the Black, Black Point area um, down that side. So Georgetown is in the red zone for those persons who are um, questioning whether you're in the red zone or not. Our current alert level remains at orange. We know that we have the ongoing effusive eruption at the Lassa Freire volcano, and it will um, it may continue for a while, as Dr. Robertson would have said, said we may stop or we can't we can go into an explosive eruption. So what do we do all this time? We need to continue our planning and preparation for any eventuality. And in this way, in this um, time that we have, we, we are zeroing on our evacuation planning, tidying up a bit, a piece, a bit of bits and pieces here and there. And if there's an evacuation order being given, the authority lies with the um, chairman of the National Emergency Management Organization, which is the Honorable Prime Minister and the Minister responsible for disaster management. He can issue the evacuation order or on his behalf, I can also issue that order. Now, many persons are wondering when you give this evacuation order, um, how are you going to get this information? There are different modes of communication that we will use and the ones that we use um, daily. and. We will also use the cap.cap. If you haven't downloaded that, it's actually a mobile application, cap.cap. You can get that on your Android phone or on your, your Mac and your iPhones. And you can actually download that application and you can receive the early warning from Nemo. You can also receive information from the Med Services. This is an application that is available in different countries also. You can get it in Barbados. If you're in Barbados, St. Lucia, a few other countries, you will just have to um, log in to the particular country that you're in to receive that. We will send our communication message, our evacuation order will go by all, by all radio stations. All of our media releases go to all the radio stations in St. Vincent and the Grenadines. We'll use our social media platform our Facebook, our Twitter, our um, Instagram, SMS messages, our um, mobile providers have agreed to for us to um, use the platform to send out information to the public. The police in the community also will be part, is a major part of this evacuation planning and process as that they will drive around in their communities with the bullhorns informing co community members that um, evacuation orders given and, and give directions. And of course, the community groups and leaders within the communities, we have been working with the Red Cross and other groups within the communities for a number of years, over 15 years um, from the time NIMBOK came into existence and um, longer than that, in terms of having bullhorns being allocated to, uh, to members of the community so that they can actually go around and disseminate the message once we pass on that information to them. So at the community level, um, the community leaders will receive the message and of course the police and to note in the evacuation planning, especially the, the physical evacuation, the police will actually take control of the movement of persons in and out of the evacuation um, zones and will coordinate at the assembly points and at the staging areas. What will the community use? The communities themselves have developed their own or indicated to us the methods that they want to use to communicate to their residents. We have the church bells, the megaphones, the blowing of the vehicle horns, and the conch shell. And of course, we saw in the video somebody said that yeah, the they shouted out, you know, from one commission that will be used in terms of um, indicating this evacuation order. Now a lot of persons have been asking about what are the assembly points. I, this is just a general here showing you what the assembly points are in the red zone. And I will zero in on Georgetown a bit. The work that we have been doing over the years um, span, span, um, span quite a range of activities from developing the hazard, hazard maps for the various communities 
is, and we have developed some so far in collaboration with the Seismic Research Center, and I will just show you a few that we have done here, and then I will zero in on Georgetown. We're not quite finished yet with the, a map similar to Georgetown, but we have other maps that we have used and work with other communities and other organizations over the years. Here we see the fancy community hazard map, and this is just giving you an indication of the work we have been um, doing with the Seismic Research Center on the Volcano Ready Project in terms of looking at a multi-hazard environment and being able to well, the key person, the key um, person, the, the assembly point, emergency shelters, because we're looking at multi hazard and different activities um, that the community will undertake. Um, point community hazard map, just that we are really working in those communities. We have the most points or the assembly points that we evacuation, um, the OWIA wharf, for example, and the junction um, to the playing field and at point in the Courtney, Courtney Square. This is just some assembly points also within the um, orange zone from North Leeward and Chateaubillion and Fitzhughes, but in particular for this particular um, crisis, we are paying close attention to Chateaubillion and Fitzhughes because they are the closest communities to on the, to the western flank where we have the dome growth. And in the event that these communities, um, we have a, an explosive eruption, it's most likely that these two communities will have to be evacuated um, first along with the communities of Fancy because we must evacuate those communities over the Rabaka River and, and in this particular scenario, the Chateaubillion and Fitzhughes. Just, just, uh, just a quick shot of um, Chateau Belay, Belay um, hazard map. Now, where do you go when you're evacuated? And these are um, some of the um, next few slides I will I will take a um, look at this. Now, according to our last census, we have in the red zone 5,062 persons and in the orange zone 10,577 um, persons um, roughly. Now, this may increase, and that's why we have a ballpoint figure of 20,000. We, we had at about, about that number in 1979 to be evacuated. And we use this ballpoint figure because we know there are persons who will be very uncomfortable within their communities when you hear those, those stones falling on your roof that they too will want to evacuate. So we, we have a rough figure for approximately 20,000 persons that will need to be evacuated. There are other things that we have assets in those communities too that will need to be um relocated or repositioned. We have three warehouses in, in Noel, 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 Georgetown and Rose Hall, and these will be repositioned to um, Bible, Bible and Curtains Playing Field. No, sorry, these, these will be repositioned to Bible, Calico and Bowley in, in, in particular to serve those communities that um, will have the population that have to be evacuated. Our staging areas, there are two major staging areas according to our, our plan, and it's this, it was similar to in 1979, the Bible playing field and the curtains playing field. That is where when persons evacuated, at least if persons self-evacuate and they're not sure where they are going, these are the two areas that will be activated or stood up in terms of our incident command that persons can go to get information and, and then be dispatched to the various um, emergency shelters that have been allocated for the different communities. And we'll be using the, utilizing emergency shelters from North U Union to Bali and of course in the interior, um, up in the interior Mespo, Richland Park, Greggs and those communities. Now let's watch song here a bit. This is a map that was developed on, um, a few years ago by the Pan American Development um, Fund. It's a community project that was ongoing and we, we worked and had some input with this um, particular group. I note one of the members was actually on the, trying to ask a question earlier. And this is really depicting more of central central um, Georgetown, if you want to call it that way, and some of the um, areas and the sites in Georgetown that we know um, persons will be able to meet in the event of an evacuation. So this is some of the work that has been ongoing in St. Vincent and the Grimlins um, through various communities and various projects. I want to zero in here on um, the, what are the assembly points in Georgetown? Pen, many persons are asking these kind of questions and assembly points is where we'll ask you to meet in the event of an evacuation. This is where the public transportation will go or you will go to coordinate transportation for evacuation out of the community if you have not yet self-evacuated. 
and you know I don't want to go through all, but it's really speaking to the various um, um, communities in Georgetown, for example, the old playing field that persons will go go there from Cobertong, Brownstown, for example. We have the Chili playing field, um, Langley Park School, Cali Shopping, Dixon, Spring Village, um, Junction Gap, um, just to name a few. And of course, it continues. And um, as we know, Georgetown is considered a, a white community. We have the Perseverance Gap, where persons from O'Brien's Valley and Perseverance and the New Village there will go to Old, old Chapman School, cater for the new village in Chapman's and the housing area, Evelyn Shop at Junction New Chapman's, and that will cater for those people on top of the hill by New Chapman's, and of course the Black Point entrance to cater for those residents just above the gas station in Mount Young area that may not have private transportation. I know this is a bit small, but many persons are asking, when I evacuate, where do I go? What we have um, in our revised national plan, what we aim to do in this particular instance is at least, at least we can assign communities and shelters where persons from a particular community will go. So far, we have narrowed it down to, for example, the persons in Georgetown uh, will go to these, these particular shelters in Kingston. So most, like, most likely that you'll be evacuated to, to Kingston in this particular scenario. And um, for communities like Fancy, the Fancy will go to um, Calico and Ratamil area. So we are, we are actually zeroing it down and, and actually have put in more context in, to know exactly where do you want to go or where you want to evacuate to. And this is important, especially if persons are, are separated, that you know your community is moving from one community to X community so that you know your family within will be within one of the shelters within that area. And this will um, go well, for example, if there's an evacuation in the day, somebody might be in town um, and the family evacuating and you don't know where you're going to meet them. So you have a general idea of the emergency shelters that they will be able to go. They will be um, assigned to uh, in general. Now, as part of form of our evacuation procedures, it really begins with an individual and it also goes at the community and level. And we really encouraging persons. We have the time now. We we think that a volcano has given us a little time to ensure that everything is in place. We need to ensure that we have our individual family emergency plans, and you need to make arrangements if you do. If you have someone you can stay within the green zone, that is of course our preferred choice. That you have someone somewhere you can actually go and visit or stay with for some time. But not thinking that we are going to forget you if you go and stay with a friend or family. You must also register and indicate to us that you are staying with a friend or family. And we, of course, continue to work with the community teams, the community emergency teams in, in Georgetown. We have the Red Cross group that is led by Veronica John, and we have Mr. Huggins, who leads the District Disaster Committee in Georgetown. So these are, are key persons, and they have a team with them. It's not one person alone, and they need more persons to come on board to really work with them, because they will need to mobilize the teams at the assembly points, coordinate the transportation, and of course, course, provide assistance that may need assistance. What we are asking the communities, communities to do, we would have done some vulnerability and capacity assessments in these communities through the Red Cross or through of our own, through community development, and really um, identifying the vulnerable populations that we have in Georgetown, in Georgetown and the Georgetown communities. And this is information that we'll need also to be able to share with our partners in that who do we have to cater for that will be evacuated. And especially to know that some persons may not be able to be in a, in a public shelter or mass shelter environment that they may need to be um, located elsewhere or sheltered elsewhere. Because one of our plans for this year, if in the event that we have a, an explosive eruption is to really have that partnership, which is ongoing now with the, um, the guest houses and hotels, the Ministry of Tourism has, has already had some dialogue with the guest houses and hotel and, and hotels and those that will accept. We don't have those listed because they're private, they're private buildings, but those we we are aware of them and we know the the, the, the guest houses that will accommodate persons if needed. Um what we want to ask the community to continue because we have some of the information, but it is really at the community level that we need to get more information. How many vehicles that we have in a particular community that will be able to transport persons and um, private transport, including minibuses. And in that way, we will know the number of persons that we need to have sent public transportation for. And I'll give you an example. The fancy community they have already done their work. Their, their emergency plan is ready. They have identified 530 persons in their community 
170 persons they can evacuate using their own public private transportation. They have about 24, 25 vehicles within the community. So they have indicated to us, okay, 170 persons will be evacuated given the time frame once it once they have enough time. And once these vehicles are within the community, they can actually evacuate 170 persons um, within a short space of time, but they will need assistance to evacuate the remainder of the population. So this is a kind of information we are working with the communities and we have been working with them over the years so we can actually zero in and, and be a bit more specific on the population that we have to, we have to serve. Now, um, during an evacuation procedure, there will be announcement on the time the buses will be at the assembly point, so you're not there waiting for hours, you know, and at, as you as you go, go there to, there will be all, we, you know, we want persons to be orderly in the event of evacuation, there will be registration ongoing, so that, that we know which, whether you're going to bus H, H599, or just, just to give a random um, um, vehicle number, so that we know that we can account for you and be able to trace you over a period of time if, in case we you know anybody is looking for you so these are the kind these are the um, part of the evacuation procedures that are involved included in the national volcano volcano emergency plan that the prime minister would have um, spoke about earlier now as part of our national planning so we had we have the we had in we had the individual level um, disaster managers, the individual responsibility also. We have the community level and we have the national level. And the community feeds into the national response. And this is just a snapshot. I, I instead of going into the entire plan in terms of adding our standard operating procedures for evacuation. And in evacuation planning, we have to think of both a day scenario and a night scenario. And on the left, I just have the, some of the agencies that will be involved in the evacuation pro, um, process according to our SOP, our standard operating procedures, and of course, a range of um, response responsibility. But as I said before, the physical evacuation really comes under the ambit of the police and that will be led by the Commission of Police and his team. And as you can see there on the right, um, the various roles and responsibility and procedures and activities that will be undertaken once an evacuation um, order is given um, by the key agencies involved. So that's a, just a snapshot of what is happening um, in the event of evacuation. So I just want to show you a just a few um, slides now. And many persons um, think that we have not been doing work over the years. We have done a tremendous of work with the Seismic Research Center, um, with other entities, the Red Cross, with other, other groups that have worked on, on volcano um, planning for volcanic emergencies. And these are some snapshots from our exercise trade winds in 2019. Many persons thought, well, okay, why are we exercising a, vol a volcano? But we know that we are living with this risk. We knew that it will it erupt, erupt at some time. Many of us hope it will erupt in our lifetime, but it is erupting effusively, and we don't know what is going to happen in the future, so we have to plan for reality. So these are just a snapshot looking at our National Emergency Operations Center during the trade wind exercise. You can see a range of um, players um, here, and so too if there's, a, if there's an explosive eruption, we have, have support from a regional organization or local organizations. Um, here we had someone from Martinique, where we had somebody from, from the French Red Cross, and of course we had a soldier there from Jamaica, so it is a quite a regional effort that we have been undertaking over the years. This is showing you the um, evacuation via sea that we had on the, on the west coast, and um, it was successful in this particular exercise. We were able to evacuate 200 persons within 15 minutes. Um, it took just 15 minutes for the boat to get up to, to um, Bowley. On the women's side, it was a bit more challenging in that um, it took us quite a while to move persons from the OWA fisheries complex to the Coast Guard vessel. So we know, um, yes, we have the plans for sea evacuation within our plan, but knowing that the challenges on the on the on the um, coast may be a bit more cha and challenging on or difficult on than on the on the west coast um Bowley, um Chate between Bowley and Chatterbilly area because the waters are calmer. And I will end with just this this last um photo again showing the persons um, lining up to evacuate during our exercise and basically persons at the Bowley um school, Bowley primary school there, um welcome in the evacuees um from from 2019 um exercise. So these are the, some of the things we are, are working on. We have been engaged within the both the red and orange zones, but also in the green zones, because we have communities like Calico who's ready to receive persons. They have been meeting, so we'll be doing more community sessions within within all the communities because we have the those that will be evacuated and those that will be received persons for the next of eruption. So thank you very much. Um, and any questions I'll be remaining to answer. Thank you very much. Uh, 
Director of NEMO, Ms. Michelle Forbes, for your presentation. We'd also like to thank all of the other presenters before you. Of course, you are the final uh, presenter in our lineup this evening. At this point, we'd also like to remind viewers that you can post your questions on YouTube Live and on the chat on uwitv.org. I understand that there are two persons with raised hands who would like to ask some questions. Are they ready? Do we have Natalie again? Natalie and Leon? Okay, so while we await Natalie and Leon, um, they are up, but I'm not hearing or seeing what's happening with them. I don't know if someone can let me know um, what's happening. But in the meantime, maybe we can take some questions from our other platforms. Are there any questions from the other platforms that we have? Okay, so there's a question. What forum will NEMO use to let people know that they need to evacuate? Will this message come from NEMO or from the police? And this question is for Ms. Forbes, of course, and it's coming from UWITV. Michelle Forbes? What yeah. forum? <laughs> Okay. Yeah, what form would we use to disseminate the information? Yes, all, okay. all, all, all forms of our um, communication flow, which will be via the radio, via the social media. We will inform the police also. Once the police is informed, then they can also go around and, do the evac and give the evacuation order once they have received it from us. So all, all forms of um, communications will be used to disseminate the evacuation order and information to the public. Okay. Thank you very much for your response. This is Leon now. Can you hear me? Yes, we are, Leon. Yes. yes. Well, we know we have, we, yeah, we know we have the pandemic on us, right? And evacuation process where social distance is, is quite phenomenal right now. How can, how many people can we move in a quick time because of social distancing and what kind of methods we, do we have people to check the temperature and those kind of things? Ms. Forbes. Yes, Ms. Forbes, your question. Yes, yes. We would have, we would have actually put these measures in place um, since before the start of the 2019, 2020 hurricane season in working with the Ministry of Health. And we have these are the procedures that you will and um, guidelines um, to enter the emergency shelters. Even transportation in the, in the in the buses, you must have your mask um, before you can board the bus. Um, when you get to the emergency shelter, you will be um, your temperature will be checked. You will be registered, and we'll have a bit more robust um, questioning on your health status, whether you have whether you have been exposed um, to the virus or somebody who has been in contact, um, or have you been in close contact? So, asking the shelter, the all emergency shelters to have a separate um, room or, or section where persons who may have flu-like symptoms can be isolated or um, quarantined until health personnel get to them. In the scheme of things, uh, during our, our um, activation for emergency shelters, the district um, health, health services team also do visit the emergency shelters. They may not be there at, at the time of um, registering, but they did visit daily at the emergency shelters to really check what is happening. And of course, any um, unusual high temperatures or any anything that is a suspect that they will be reported by the shelter manager immediately to, to the district health team. We are also going to equip the shelter managers with PPEs um, as we're in the COVID environment. Um, that's personal protective equipment so that they reduce the spread of, uh, of them actually um, um, being affected while serving in the emergency shelter. So these are the procedures that we have had in place since um, 2020 and will continue into, into um, this particular pandemic um, period. 
Okay, Michelle, a um, couple questions from our Q&A. Are there any plans for livestock? And someone also wants to know, Mansu Kofi wants to know what should residents expect on their arrival at the evacuation center? And is there anything in place if there's an electricity failure and heavy rainfall? So that's three questions for you right there. Okay, in terms of the livestock, we um, the Ministry of Agriculture has actually a livestock plan, so they will address the issue of um, livestock um, in their plan. And, and I know they were making cont having contingencies to to look at the livestock um, for persons, of course. Um, so they will address that um, fall under the Ministry of Agriculture. When you go to the evacuation centers, it's one of the second questions. When you go to the evacuation centers, of course ask you as during the hurricane season when you're going to the emergency shelter you take what you can with you you know, you take some bedding you take a little bit of food you take water you take your, your your usual supplies your medicines when you get there once we have once we have enough um warning time we will have um cots and blankets dispatched to all the emergency shelters the thing is that a lot of shelters do not have this where you can actually store these items. So they have to be moved in um, the same time that evacuation is ongoing. And you may not you may not always have the lead time. So you take what you can to the emergency shelter, but the cuts and those things will be will be actually um, transported into the emergency shelters or the evacuation centers, as you see. In terms of electricity, not all not all emergency shelters have um, backup power. So if there's if electricity goes, then you have lan lanterns and lamps and, and 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 flashlights. And we ask you also, as part of your go to bag, to have those things with you, flashlights, and especially if you're evacuating in the night. And these things should be packed in your bag. So we. Um, um, most of the evacuation centers do not have backup power. So during the night, of course, you will have to use the lamps and, and um, that available, not the gas lanterns. We're looking at battery operated lanterns because we don't want another threat or risk in terms of having fires. Uh, in terms of heavy rainfall, we're in a multi-hazard environment. These are things that we you, we have to plan for. We have heavy rainfall all the time. We can we can have this particular erupt, um, effusive eruption phase going into the hurricane season where we have all these hazards. So we're in a multi-hazard environment and we have dealt with, with flooding and all of these um, hazards and threats before. So there's not going to be anything um, new. If rain is falling, we evacuate the same. We take all the necessary precautions as we do take um, during the periods of heavy rainfall. Okay, and Natalie wants to know what about if I choose to rent a house? And someone is saying that they think they missed the point where you mentioned where will the persons from Georgetown be evacuated to? Um, for where would persons from Georgetown evacuated to? It's generally in the Kingston area, Richmond Hill, Kingston area. That's those are the designated um, emergency shelters for the persons um, from the Georgetown communities. Um, from Natalie, um, yes, um, that's something that we are exploring. I'm not going to say yes or no yet, but that's something that we're exploring. There are persons who have already indicated that they will want, they will, they have um, contacted persons where they can rent and their family can stay together. And that's something I know that our, our organization will be taking on board and the government will be taking on board for those persons who want to find their, their own arrangements or make their own arrangements. Okay, someone is saying that they saw a document that one of the assembly points is at the bridge in Georgetown where the buses turn. Has Nemo considered the congestion that might be there because it's one way traffic? Yes, and these are these are some of the points that are casting us among themselves and say, okay, well, we don't want this to be used. We 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 work with the community and, and actually choose those um choose those um assembly points. We don't choose them. Just just to bear in mind that they're not selected by by the staff anymore. There's, these points are selected by the members in the community. So if of course you you decide as a group that you want different actually different assembly points or different meeting points, that can be arranged. So it's up to you in the community where you want to meet. But we do we will take that into consideration. Okay, um, how can the public access the up-to-date disaster and evacuation plan? And is it that the green area would be totally safe regardless of the type of eruption? Or is there a possibility the folks in the green area may have to get evacuated as well? Um, 
we expect that once we have um, gone through the normal procedures for the evacuate for the plans, or, or plans have to be approved by approved, go through the approval process. As soon as that is completed, we expect within a week or so we should have those um, uploaded um, and can be available to, to various um, persons. We have um, key, key institutions that have the plan now because we're actually ensuring that um, things, are, things are tidied up. So as soon as that approval process is, is um, completed, but we, what, what we're doing here tonight is actually sharing some, some pieces of the plan. So, you know, um, to, to the general public and the population in Georgetown in general. In terms of the green zone, maybe I will ask Richie to, to answer that in terms of um, the persons in the green zone. Um, yes, thank you, Michelle. Um, given what Sufra has done, given what it is capable of, we anticipate that the most that the green zone will have to deal with is ash, in um, periodic ash fall and really only when the wind blows to the south. It has happened in, in the past. Most often the dominant wind directions are to the east and west, but on rare occasions it can be to the south. And if that is the case, then yes, that's the effect they would have. In terms of other effects such as flows and bombs and things like that, that is extremely unlikely. Um, you, you, we don't see any eruption like that happening, um, such that the island itself is compromised um, in that way. Is the ash they will have to deal with? And it can be a nuisance, but we anticipate that it wouldn't be, it would be periodic. It wouldn't be persistent for for days on end. That would be quite unusual. The wind pattern will have to change on, on um, completely for that to happen. Okay. And since you do have the microphone, Professor, what are the chances of there being a pyroclastic eruption? Um, I think the person, I don't know what a paraclastic eruption is. I think they might be speaking about an explosive eruption that pushes, produces some things that are called paraclastic flows. I've actually been speaking about them before. Um, when I speak about the flows, I didn't call them always paraclastic flows, but they are. Essentially, one of the most dangerous things from explosive eruptions from our volcano is the fact that when an explosion happens, sometimes, the, well, often the material goes up in the air and it creates a plume but sometimes it can collapse on itself. And all that material, all that hot ash and gas and everything, then moves down the mountainside very quickly as a flow that is called a pyroclastic. It, it, pyroclastic comes from the fact that it's hot class, hot pieces of rock moving on the mountainside, following the valleys very fast, bulldozing and destroying everything in its way. That's the most, that's the most dangerous things from our volcanoes. And they can happen and they often happen in explosive eruptions. It's a characteristic of explosive eruptions from, from volcanoes like ours. So once you have an explosive eruption, pyroclastic flows or density currents, as we call them, can move down the mountainside and can affect and destroy lots of areas lower down on the flanks of a volcano, which is precisely why we need to move people out of harm's way and get them south. Okay, and um, another question for you, Professor. Is there a chance that La Soufre can go extinct after an explosive eruption, if it occurs? Well, we don't like to use extinct with volcanoes like La Soufre because they're relatively young. Um, and there's no indication that La Soufre has gotten so old that it will never erupt again. And that's where we use the term extinct. So, but yes, it is possible. And Soufre has often have had long periods of what we call repose or long quiet periods in between eruptions. That's how they behave. Our volcanoes, in fact, in the whole Caribbean, our volcanoes, and, and that's perhaps one of the problems with them, our volcanoes erupt very infrequently and therefore people forget that they can erupt and therefore, you know, they're not so well prepared for eruptions. Fortunately, well, Supra is not necessarily one of them. Ours is one of the more active ones. But I can see it at, in this present stage of his life, I don't see it going extinct. I think it's gonna be active for quite a long time. In fact, longer than most of us will be wrong. Um, and from time to time in this current live state, it will erupt from time to time. Okay, um, Bob, back to you. Um, someone wants to know, persons who do not want to move, will they be forced to move? And if so, how? Not will not be forced to leave to move. We um we will ensure that we let the persons know that an evacuation order is given, and if you choose to stay, you'll be staying at your own risk. 
Okay. Yeah, um, may I just, oh, sorry, sorry. I was just going to say, um, Teresa, that when a, a national emergency under the NEMO Act, on the, if a national emergency is declared, not a state of emergency, there, there's that authority to involve, which, would, which could involve compulsion. And of course, you can always declare a state of emergency for the, the geographic area or for the whole country for that matter, for the period when the, when the volcanic eruption takes place. In which case, if you declare state of emergency, you will have a certain of your fundamental rights and freedoms are suspended. But Michelle answered the way she answered, because it is not the intention of the government to use the law as a sword. We use it as a shield. And that is why we want to build in everything that we do a consensus to show persons that it is within the interest. If you, if we have a greater response, sense of responsibility with these challenges, and we know we have to live well with these things on an ongoing basis as a community, it makes really far better sense for everybody to buy in. You may have a few recalcitrant ones, but there is a challenge in using the law as a sword. You may, you may, you may get pushed back, but if you, if you try to encourage people, and, and this is what we have been doing. So Michelle is quite correct in that sense, that you know, you, you, your own self-interest is at stake, and we will persuade you. But there is the legal framework to induce compulsion. But one doesn't want to do that. The, 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 the state, the government will prefer for us all to be persuaded. Doing it in a commandist manner is, has its problems. It is better you do it in an authoritative way, not a commandist way, an authoritative way with buying from everyone. And that is why, you know, when I'm, I, mean, I sit here listening to Professor Robinson, Robertson and, and to Michelle and to see the, 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 the distance we have come in terms of preparation for events like, possibly events like a volcanic, uh, an explosive volcanic eruption. It, 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 it really is um, a mark of the, the, the progress. And, and I'm urging all those who are involved in disseminating information, not to pick on this little thing or that, but for all, all, us all to move forward in a united manner on things like these. I make the same point with COVID. I make the same point with, 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 with um, hurricanes and, and, the, and floods and the like. And I make the point very emphatically with the a, a, a possible um, volcanic, explosive volcanic eruption. So that's what I would add to what Michelle has said. I don't think I've misspoken in that regard, Michelle, in respect of where the, the, the law permits the, the, a compulsion in the manner in which I describe it, that, 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 that can happen, both under the NEMO Act and generally speaking, in the declaration of a state of emergency. Thank you very much, Prime Minister, for that response. Uh, Michelle, we are back. Someone wants to know whether there's a plan for the disabled and does the evacuation plan cover all aspects, including a nighttime explosive eruption? In the planning, yes, we have we have the scenario, we have the two scenarios: um, evacuation dr during the day and evacuation at night. And we have, of course, the evacuation at night will be a bit more um, um, challenging. So yes, the plan caters for both um, evacuation day and night. In terms of the disabled, we um, 
we ask in the persons within the, as we said, we are collecting information on the vulnerable po population. I know the Ministry of Health and the Ministry of Mobilization, they also have that information and they, they actually have indicated they work in, in their plan to look at some of the issues of the disabled and the, and the physically challenged. Um, we also ask in the communities to map or identify these key vulnerable persons and that we'll need to really um, cater for in the event of an evacuation. So that's part of the of the um, ongoing planning in terms of being able to assist or support those with um with physically challenges, physically challenge and, and, and other challenges, mobility issues that we have in the community. So that's all part of the plan, but also as families, we encourage you to have your own individual plan that you deal with your for your persons within your home who may be um, so challenged. So it's a, it's a really a, a, a united effort, a coordinated effort with the families that are being have those um, individuals in their home, and also at the national level between us, the Ministry of Mobilization, and all the entities that will be involved. Okay, and someone said that we heard you mention fancy. They're impressed, but where do persons in Chile go to register themselves to be evacuated? Because I'm sure you like to know how much of us need to be evacuated. In Chile, I um, no, oh, what's his name? Chile, we have a, a someone there that, um, that is on the committee. There is it James Brown, but you can all, you can actually um, get information from James Brown and a few other persons. You can also get the information from the community development officers for those for those communities. The persons from Chile would 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 go to the areas where everybody from Georgetown would be going because Chile is is part of the, the Georgetown conurbation, part of the Georgetown area. And 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 um, from the, the points, the points of where you're gathering, as Michelle pointed them out, anybody from Chile would be able to get within walking distance to any of those points. So that shouldn't be the, the important thing is to have the information about the points and of, of where the gathering points, the meeting points for the transport. Of course, some of you will have your own cars and, and, and pickups and trucks and so on. Um, and, and that would be, you know, you'll just go into what would be the broad area where, where persons from Georgetown would be going. In relation to the Teresa, the matter about the, the your, your animals, like your cattle, um, Michelle had made the point about the Ministry of Agriculture will deal with that, and and Saboto has dealt with it. The Minister of Agriculture has dealt with it the other night on a consultation, and you tag the animals. Obviously, if you come into town and you have a few heads of cattle. There's no way in tongue you can graze them. So you have to tag them and let them go. That's one option. Or if you get somewhere in South Windward, in the humble African constituency, or up in Mesville by Jimmy, um, and you get somewhere to stay there and you have two cattle, you, 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 you might be able to find some land up Montreal and so on. You know what I mean, Richie? These are individual decisions which could be made within the broad plan. And, and, and persons, there are persons who do these things. But if not, as what, what, what happened in 1979, as the, as the lady said, and as Martin Barnard said, you, 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 you let go the animals. Some of them, a few of them died, um, or they lost them. They may have one or two criminals would have gone into the area when the immediate threat had subsided before people went back and, and um, take the animals, but they'll, you, you will tag them. I think there's that process. All right. Okay, thank you. And is there any plan during evacuation for the persons over the dry river, if the rivers there are not passable? And PM, will there be measures in place to protect our assets we left behind from looters? Well, let us let us look at this in a practical way. The police will certainly return when it is safe to do so. 
You must remember police are human beings. When the sofa is blowing and you're running out, the police not going in. Because a policeman is the son of a woman, the husband or partner, and a father. Not because he's a policeman that the sofa going to respect him. So from a purely practical matter, there'd be some days immediately and, and, and Richie, Professor Robinson can say how, how, many, how many days this is likely to last in, in, in the most dangerous phase. Uh, but, but then upon the proper advice, police will, will uh, security forces will move back. Um, you have Coast Guard, you could land people at particular points if the roads are impassable. Uh, and so on and so forth. So, so there would be, there is a security plan also. But in terms of when you move out, somebody comes in to protect it from looters. I don't see that happening while it's over blowing. I don't know if, if Richie has experience, for instance, in Montserrat, whether that happened. I, I was just telling a couple of my friends who are here uh, at the office of the prime minister where we where where I am and I was asking them a couple of the the the, the employees here who are my friends and colleagues if they ever went to Montserrat and see what Plymouth Re, Richie what what Plymouth looks like the old capital now is a wasteland um, so it depends on, on a number of, of factors and circumstances. Um, thank God in 1979, we didn't have any loss of life. And while there was damage and loss, it wasn't on a scale like, for instance, you had when, 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 the, when the Sophia blew in, when the volcano blew in Montserrat. But there's a security plan. Thank you so much, Prime Minister. And we have some raised hands from our webinar. Leon and Elsia, are you there? Good evening, everyone. Um, can you hear me? Yes, yes. Okay, I have some concerns, right? I would like to know how far along the um, the community evacuation plan is for Georgetown um, in terms of have you already have transportation committed to move persons? And is there a team already assigned to each muster point so that 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 there will be ease of um of evacuation? I see a point on the plan says um you will, you're going to register persons. Um, as they enter on the buses um, at, at, at when during evacuation, right? How feasible is that? Because based on what um, Professor Robinson said, we may not have um, like days warning before an explosive um, eruption. No. I, wa I was thinking um, that- Michelle, sorry, Elgia. Yes, Mr. LT. Prime Minister. Yes, sir. Michelle, this LT who is she's a senior lady working in the statistical office in the Ministry of Finance and Economic Planning. She's a very organized woman. Get her on your committee. So we're recruiting you right now. You hear me? I, 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 hum I humbly accept. I would like to volunteer. Very good. You have a good person there, Michelle. <laughs> Thank God you're calling, girl. <laughs> okay, so that's Elthea. So Eltia had a, had a few um, comments and questions, and I really want to encourage Eltia to work with the group that's already existing in in um, Georgetown. We have a couple of groups there, and then you can lend your you can lend your expertise to those groups. And we don't want to reinvent the wheel, but get on board with the groups. Um, we will we will get your contacts so that you can actually communicate with the members there. Um, in terms of the 
of the community planning. I know that the group, they have been meeting, they have met several times in terms of having their groups assigned to the assembly points. I still think there is a work in progress and we, and um, so they're looking for persons so that can assist them in terms of mobilizing on the ground. So there's always room where persons in the community can actually join them. Um, I take your point also in the evacuation um, process that you may not be able to register persons um, going, um, going on the buses, that's, that's, I mean, that's the reality, you may not be able to do it, but certainly when you get to your first point, that you'll be able to do the registration there. But it's just a part that even though you may not get the complete names or the complete details, you must have a head count at least of the persons who have, have actually um, boarded the buses. And also when you when the buses reach to their destination or their transit point, you must have a count also of the persons on board. So you may not be able to do the full rest registration, but it is needed for, for the actual count and to really to be um to account for persons who are evacuating. Thank you, there. And Leon. Leon is next. Leon Hebron, are you still there? Yes, I'm here. You heard me? Yes, we are. Yes, is that a question per se, but is that a commendation for Miss Miss Forbes and Nemo and the Honorable Prime Minister? Good venture. Keep it up. Keep the nation informed. And thank you. Thank you, dear. And Leon is next. And thank you as well. Um, someone is asking if there are different measures that you yes. 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 So someone wants to know if there are different measures which would be taken, whether it be night or day during an explosive eruption. Bob? I, I, we had a similar question earlier too, and that indicate that we have different procedures. We have in our plan, it caters for both the night um, evacuation, the day evacuation. Of course, in the night, you will need lighting at the sites, for example, wherever you're going to evacuate persons to. And of course, you'll be, have to be extremely um, cautious. So there's always a difference between the night and day um, evacuation. And you have we all of that is on board in, is taken on board in our planning. So there will be different resources that will be needed for the night versus what you may need um, for during the day. And of course, it depends on the time also of when the evacuation or is given, is given what time of the night or what time of the day. Okay, Michelle, thank you for that. Um, just a reminder to participants that you will need to Provide a name if you're asking a question so that our webinar participants, please give your name if you're asking a question. Um, from UWI TV, perhaps for Professor Robertson or Nemo, what level of preparation should people living in the green zone make to be able to effectively live through an explosive eruption in terms of food, water, etc.? I would say that you make the same preparations because you have to be prepared in the green zone for persons and influx of persons within your, well, if you want to say it, within your space. And I always make the point, for example, if you go to the clinic and you normally meet 20 persons and um, you go after an explosive eruption, you're going to meet more persons. So you have to um, take similar um, similar measures as the persons um, who are evacuating. Um, the same thing, you stock up on your food supply, just as in any emergency, you really should have to um, take the same procedures um, 
uh, measures in place. Of course, we have the, the volcano comes with its um, threats and hazards. We may have volcanic ash, um, especially if you're closer to the northern part of the island, we may have volcanic ash that you too have to protect yourself in terms of wearing the mask, not the mask, you know, same as we're wearing the mask um, for the for the current um, pandemic, but you all have you, in particular in the volcanic scenario, um, dust mask because you can have a lot of ash. So we basically have to take the, make the same um, arrangements and really be prepared to really welcome persons from the, those areas that will be evacuated. So preparations tend to be similar. Of course, you would not have to evacuate, but you would be um, affected by um, some of the same same hazards that they would be affected. Maybe not as severe, but definitely you will have some impact. Okay, from YouTube, would evacuation maps and muster points information be available online? Yes, we have actually started um, disseminating some of our um, maps online and we are now putting some graphics towards the muster points. Um, so we, those will be shared online also. And the Red Cross has um, indicated that they're willing to support the, the, the um, some of the muster point signs or the assembly point signs throughout the community. So we are working um, with different agencies. We're working, um, having the graphics both online and physical, physical um, muster points within the communities. So they will be available, and those are those are being worked on as I as I speak. So we should have those um, available this week in terms of the graphics. Okay. So there's a, a Q and A. Regarding possible evacuation, by and large, there is a single main road out of the red and orange zone, and I suspect bottleneck situations may be created in some places during evacuation. Have you identified alternative routes for evacuation? A population map shows the importance of this, particularly on the windward side of the island, where there are more persons to be moved. Suggestion using a DM with a road overlay to identify the safest alternative route out of the red and orange zone. And that's from O. Oliver. Well, I know he also gave his um, um, recommendations. There is a separate transportation plan that is, is will be coordinated and, up, and executed by the police in terms of um, trying to restrict the traffic as much as possible within those areas, as the, as the um, list indicated. It's a one way in, one way out, especially on the Windward Highway, um, most of the, and Windward and Leeward Highway. So um, we expect there will be some bottlenecks, but of course, um, as part of the transportation plan, we know that the, the police and the other entities are working to have a, have a smooth transition in the event that we have a, an evacuation order um, given for an explosive eruption. Okay, and someone is saying that um, the question of the impassable river was not addressed. In terms of the river, um, and we had we had a similar discussion not too long ago um, today, uh, and we, from the, from the experience with the last of Rare volcano, it has to be if really bad off for you to really stay back into the community to to have the passable river many persons think that um when the initial eruption is going to come down with all the pyroclastic flows and all of that that on may not happen and i'm kind of answering like dr robertson you know um but really once evacuation order is given, is for you to get out as soon as possible. And normally, when the when the volcano starts to starts to erupt, it doesn't necessarily send stuff down the along the river. We don't know if that will happen. But basically, if you if you're stuck above the river and then you the other po point of evacuation is via sea, via the Oweo Wharf, if you can get to get there. So we're hoping that once you start seeing something happening, once you get the evacuation order, you will actually leave before it reaches that stage where we can actually have any heavy flow down to not just the Rabica River because it has to be a, a pretty um, heavy flow to take out the Rabica River but also down the other tributaries that you see the regular flooding normally have happens during the hurricane season. So it is important important to really understand the signs and being able to take action when the evacuation order is given or if you see something unusual that is happening. Okay, Michelle, somebody is saying that their previous question, um, re-evacuation wasn't adequately addressed. They want to know specifically what to expect in relation to sanitation, water, food, 
sleeping quarters, security, bathroom, etc., in the event that they are evacuated. Well, as much as possible, we are going to have, um, as indicated earlier, the shelters will be activated. Persons are expected to take their food, um, food for a few days, water also, and as as quickly as we can get these amenities into the emergency shelters, they will they will be done. Um, for example, some churches that will be used as evacuation centers may not have food as yet. Food will actually have to have to take into those um, emergency shelters, so that may take some time. But also, but those schools and so that are used as emergency shelters that have supplies in 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 the shelters, those are being used. So we ask in you when you evacuate for the first few hours that you need to be able to uh, be a little bit self-sufficient um, in taking some food some water and some of your own supplies and that's why we in encourage you to have your your grab and go bag um, ready so that you have something for yourself until the system kicks into place because you um, you may have a lot of you may not have a lot of time to plan in terms of activating the shelters you cannot have food sitting at an emergency shelter for a year and you don't have anything happen so these are things that have to be brought in um at each emergency shelter it's different some may have more bathrooms more more um showers some may not have but though we we actually have those listed that we know what has showers um versus um water tanks, extra storage of water tanks, those have the kitchen. So all of those things that we have in our plan so that we know if a particular shelter does not have these amenities that they will have to be provided for. So let's not fool ourselves within the first few hours where things are gonna be, um, have to put in place. But when you get there right now, everything may not be in place. So it is up to you also to ensure that you have your own um, supplies that you can take with you for first, at least for the also for the first few hours. But we know that we are working towards ensuring that all of those things will be in place. If I may just add to what Michelle has said, and I think it's an excellent answer, because there is, there is unevenness in the facilities, in the quality of the facilities at um, the emergency shelters. Michelle's team has sent for me. I requested it and they, they, they had it prepared for every emergency shelter there is a checklist as to toilets, bathrooms, water tanks. The newer schools which we built have bathroom facilities, toilets upstairs and downstairs, and they have more showers. And they also have a water tank, every one of them. But you have to remember this, why you would have to take your, some water. Water is cut off, let's go there. The, the, the ash is going to fall in the, in the tanks, in the water tanks. In 1979, one of the problems in Beckway is that the water tanks, Richie had a lot of ash in them so that CWSA, as part of the overall plan, has to have, in addition to you taking water for the first couple of hours, as Michelle said, we'll have to move water if you have a problem with, um, with, with that the water is in fact cut off at the particular shelters. We must remember this too. We are fortunate in St. Vincent and the Grenadines that the water, the, the areas, the, the water catchments which serve the whole country, all of them are interconnected. So that if you, when you come into areas which are not directly affected like in the, in the red zone or the orange zone, you're, you're going to have, as you had in 1979, water inside of your own um, community, in the, in, the, in the community to which you're going. So that's, but just in case you don't get it, arrangements, plans are made so that water could be, you can get to you just like in, the, in, in, in any hurricanes when the water is cut off or any storm, you have to bring water. 
But let us understand this. And we, this thing is not going to be a bed of roses. If you have to move, you're accustomed to being in your own bedroom. You're going into a school or you're going into to, to some other facility. If it's a, 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 a guest house or, or anything like that, apartments, building, the, the, the place is going to be more crowded than usual. So we have to get our heads around these practical things. And as Michelle said, we are planning in a way to have certainly the accommodation and the facilities better than, much better than we had in 1979. But still, it's not going to be your home, eh? And that's why she said the ideal thing is as many persons as possible get to stay with their friends or family to ease the, the, public, the, the public pressure. And that's why all of us have to buy in in this enterprise. Um, moderator, can I just add to that um, and endorse with the Prime Minister in the context that one, and particularly regarding a question that was asked in terms of what effects you would have in the green zone. If you have an explosive eruption, one of the main effects that you have throughout the country is the potential for ash to get into everything. Um, and as you know, most of our catchments for water is, is open. So um, it's, a, it's a problem that was identified before in previous exercises to the CWSA and they know that. And I suspect that they will have to put in measures to deal with the fact that you potentially could have ash in quite a few areas and the effects that that could have on your water supply. And it's something that needs to be factored into the equation in terms of planning. Um, certainly the effects of ash, whether it is intermittent or what is, is, is much more heavy, it basically could, could cause wider impacts than just simply on the volcano itself. Thank you, Professor. Um, we'd like to ask a question of Professor Landis, the chair of the UWI COVID-19 task force at this time. And that question is, how is the UWI supporting national authorities such as NEMO and the government of St. Vincent and the Grenadines with the COVID response? Okay, um, the UWI um, task force is a regional task force. So we um, are deployed across the whole Caribbean, uh, whether that's uh, CARICOM members like um, Haiti, um, Suriname, or Barbados or St. Vincent. Um, the way we work is everything we do is at the invitation of CARICOM. So uh, we work uh, every week, we meet with the core coordinating group, which would be CARFA and SEDEMA, the um, uh, Caribbean uh, Emer uh, Disaster and Emergency Management Agency. And of course, SEDEMA is the actual um, organ that would interface with um, uh, Michelle and, and with the St. Vincent Emergency Services. So, so we would provide um, uh, whatever expertise is needed when there is a, is a disaster. I think you would know that, um, you know, when Hurricane Erica, um, Tropical Storm Erica struck um, Dominica, you know, we would come in and provide the kind of um, support that's needed immediately, things like water quality experts, things like um, uh, uh, things like um, uh, engineers, um, uh, also um, psychologists, you know, when there's uh, uh, populations who are traumatized, um, you know, you have to uh, provide that kind of support. So uh, unfortunately, we've had a lot of um, experience um, with hurricanes, and we think it will be relatively similar, the kind of support that we offer, um, you know, with our engineers, our, our, um, uh, our, our uh, uh, doctors, our um, uh, psychological sport expert, experts. Um, and now, of course, with COVID, we would provide whatever expertise we can. Listening to um, uh, Michelle, I really had nothing to add to uh, the preparations uh, during a time of pandemic that, that she has um, outlined. They're uh, already uh, published um, by CARFA. And, uh, you know, she has, um, uh, she has specified all those additional measures. Uh, I have nothing further to add to what, what what she had to say. So uh, suffice to say that, um, you know, when a hurricane happens like Dorian, the last one, Yui is right there. Thank you so much, Professor. And as we 
get into the final stages of today's program. Ayin Lassoufre, we'd like to invite the previous presenters to give us their uh, final comments, starting, of course, with Prime Minister, the Honorable Dr. Ralph E. Gonzalez. I will yield more, of, I will yield my time <coughs> to Michelle and, um, and Professor Robertson. And just, I just want to say, let us be calm, let us be focused, let us be united, and don't allow false information and mischievous people to distract us. Just ignore that. This is a serious business. This is not about ratings for a radio show or, or, or how many likes you get on social media for saying something just contrary. You know, this, this, this is a serious business. And, and listen to the authorities and let us, let us do our work as a serious people, befitting of our Caribbean civilization and this magnificent Vincentian component. We're making the plans and you're being informed on an ongoing basis and more information will come out. But you have to listen and you have to pose the questions and get the answers as we have been doing. I think this has been a great session. Thanks to all those who have participated. Thank you, Prime Minister. Professor Robertson? Yes, thank you very much. Um, I agree. I think it's important that we continue to educate the public and that the public take the information. Um, people often ask about the question of when and how much warning we'll have for explosive activity. And they perceive that as something of the worst thing that can happen. Um, that is quite correct. It's a good question to ask. But really, the question to ask also is what am I doing at an individual level? to take the warning and take the information that you have now, to prepare for if, if that happens and when it happens, if it does. Um, there's a lot of information out there, as the Prime Minister said, as, as we've all said, there's, we give you the information all the time about what is happening, we track the dome, we give you a picture about, it, about what's happening. We tell you, I've told you what are the possibilities in terms of what we think likely at this, this volcano. I think you need to take each of them and put plans in place at an individual level for what you do, what your response would be. Um, we hope that it will end, it will end and it, 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 it goes back to sleep and we have a, a couple of years still. But the fact is, we live in a beautiful country, we have a fantastic and amazing um, country and landscape that is created by volcanoes. And, and unfortunately, every now and then, these volcanoes do what they do, which is erupt and produce new material. The same land that we live on, it was created by them. So we have to learn to live with them and learning to live with them means that we have to have plans in place to respond to the negative impacts of the eruptions that can happen. We know there are plans, we have heard about the plans, we need to get involved in making sure we understand the plans, understand what to do, so that when something happens that could harm us, we could take the action to minimize the impact of that harm on ourselves individually, on our family and on our community. Once we do that, we, we, sh we should be fine. Um, St. Vincent is one of those places that a lot of work has gone in, in terms of educating the public, in terms of preparing for volcanic emergencies. There's a reason for that. Um, seismic have always been interested in St. Vincent, particularly because it's a volcano. It has a volcano that erupts pre pretty often. Um, so, you know, we, we have all the potential means by which we can deal with what we have to face. We just need to hunker down and face it. And I think we should be in, in, in good spirits um, and we should be in good set when we do that. Um, I'd suggest that you keep on listening, keep on preparing, um, hope for the best, prepare for the worst, and we should be okay. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Professor. And Michelle Fox, you have the final say. We need to be ready for any, any even eventuality. I really want to reiterate the points of individual preparedness is key. And for those persons who want to work with the groups in the community to, to get on board, because it is a national effort. It, is a, it, is, it starts from the individual level, the community level up to the national level. And we will work with you um, during this period to ensure that we, we all are ready to face any adversities that may arise um, from any explosive eruption and also for any continued um, effusive eruption for the last of air volcano. So thank you, we and thank you to everyone for um, joining, us on, joining us on this program um, today, and um, good evening. Well, thank you so much. Thank you, Prime Minister. Thank you, Professor, and thank you, Ms. Fogg, for this very informative session. I'm sure that we all benefited tremendously from participating 
please be reminded that for additional information, participants, you can visit NEMO and the UWI SRC online platform, social media, as well as the website. And link to these will be posted in the chat for the webinar, UWI TV and YouTube. Remember, your questions can also be sent to src at sta.uwi.edu. There's a brief feedback survey link posted in the chat, and we would appreciate it very much if you would give us your feedback so that we may be able to continue to improve upon our communication. Thank you very much, UWI TV. Thank you very much, SRC. Thank you, Nemo. And we look forward to more sessions like these coming up in the future. Stay safe, everyone, and thank you for viewing. Good evening.